and I don't know. Good morning again. Um, so this is a, a series I, I'm hoping that all of us can participate in and sort of come to a better understanding of, but it's, it's not just a class on judgment and discernment, it's also a class about mercy and how it fits in with the whole panorama. Um, and so there's, I would try to get through it in about six weeks, and it's basically we're going to cover a lot of interesting aspects of it and what are our requirements. So the caveat is, is this is uh, the, just the tip of the iceberg. The study of biblical discernment and judgment is far more expansive than can be taught in five hours or six hours. And, you know, I'm just a student. I'm not uh, any kind of authority. And that the class is intended to provoke introspection, discussion, and inspiration and ultimately a call to action. So um, the purpose is to understand our individual and collective roles and responsibilities to exercise and discernment and judgment in our lives and the lives of our families and with our ecclesias. And that's really where it needs to start. The epicenter is ourselves, to judge ourselves correctly and to discern um, for our families and for our ecclesias. But that's sort of where it stops. It doesn't go out into the world because they don't follow the same patterns or laws. So it's really kind of um, not fitting um, to apply our way of living to the world because they're never going to live that way until they decide to adopt it. It's sort of like Paul says the that it takes a spiritual mind to understand spiritual things and a carnal mind can't understand it. So to witness the benefits of a healthy conscience in the Lord and to avoid self-justification through rationalization and seek only God's justification. So I would hypothesize to you that when we self-justify and when we rationalize, that is a roadblock to God's mercy, okay? I'll say it again. When we self-rationalize and we self-justify, then why would we need God's justification? Why would we need his mercy? So I want you to think about this very logically um, because this can be a very emotionally charged topic. But just think about how we put this all together literally, um, linearly um, going forward and recognize the need of a greater ecclesial and inter-ecclesial discernment and judgment to resolve recent and, and old divisions. So, um, so the theme verse is what we read every single week is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but we never, I don't think, fully read this part, which is, and this is from the Amplified, if we searchingly examined ourselves detecting our shortcomings and recognizing our own condition, we would not be judged and penalty decree by the divine judgment. So I, you may or may not love this version, but it expands the aperture of what it can mean, okay? So we read this chapter every Sunday, but we don't read this verse. Um, and it's very powerful, and I will suggest to you why. It's, in my mind, saying, if we judge ourselves correctly, if we actually did the job of self-examine like we're supposed to do, that we, we talk about every week, that Paul says, then we would not be faced with the harsh penalty of judgment. It's not saying we wouldn't find judgment at the end, but uh, more like we would have done the checklist all along or, or self-examined well enough to know. So that, that's a very powerful verse to think about. And this one is from the ASV. If we discerned ourselves, we would not be judged. Um, and the last one is from Holden's Christian Standard Bible. If we were properly evaluating ourselves, we would not be judged. So I'm giving you three different options. If you don't like the first, take the second. If you don't like the second, take the third. Or come up with another version that you like. But I think it's really powerful to consider all that's in that one little verse and unpack it and unpack it and think about it. Um, so the study of biblical perspective for believers on judgment, discernment and mercy is meant to re-examine one of the most imperative first principles 
whose correct understanding suffers from modern philosophies, individual perspectives, private interpretations, and worst of all, revisionist histories. To get back to God's perspective on the subject requires immense study, introspection, and peeling back of centuries of both worldly and Christian church traditions, theology, and now inherent thought. There are several considerations we must examine to rediscover the divine perspective for Christian believers to follow regarding where and what to discern and judge in our lives, in the lives of our families and the lives of believers in the church. So um, I think that we have a, a lot to consider with this um, and to find how to rightly apply it. When Solomon became king, he felt inept. God asked him what he wanted. What did he actually, and be careful with your answer, what did he actually ask for? We're stopping again. Somewhere? Is that working online? Okay, so I pick this up or what? Yeah, I'm going to run around with this. You're going to use that as your speaker. Okay. This is the slide I'm on. I just had notes. I had speaker notes that I was reading from. Um, can you hear me okay? Or All right. Um, so next up, I was going to talk about what are the English words for judgment and discernment. So first, I'm going to tell you there's about 20 Hebrew and Greek words for judgment. There are 14 in the Hebrew, six in the Greek. Our own ling English language doesn't help the matter when you're trying to translate it. And we have our own versions of what discernment is and judgment is. I would tell you that the, the wide, wide spectrum of these words can mean discerning between good and evil, right and wrong, clean and unclean on the one end. And on the other end, it's not just condemnation, but eternal damnation on the far end of the spectrum. So what we do is we take the English word and we throw it at everything in scripture and hope it sticks. And we assign the same meaning to it all the way through scripture. And there's a danger there. So Christadelphians are very good at parsing out words and studying this. I'm not doing it for that purpose, for the purpose of academia. I'm doing it because we wanna rightly apply what we should and shouldn't do and the strategies behind it. So we're first looking at um, what these different words means, and there's a lot of them. Um, it can mean to pass judgment in a court of law, to sit judgment upon or to pass sentence upon. So in contrast to discernment, this is huge, okay? So discernment is just understanding the difference between two things. We make hundreds of thousands of discernment decisions every day, what time to get up, whether or not to make our bed, what we're going to have for breakfast, how we're going to drive to work, you know, what we're going to have for lunch, who we're going to talk with that day, what projects we're going to work on. Everything we do is about discernment because without that tool, it would be really hard to go through our lives. But our modern civilization tells us what? Sorry? Don't judge anything. So what they're actually saying is don't discern. The big piece I would say that's different about judgment versus discernment is the first definition right here. It's not just discerning between clean and unclean, holy and unholy, righteous and unrighteous. It is following that up with a sentence of punishment, okay? So discernment does not include that. Discernment doesn't add a sentence. It doesn't add a punishment from the best that I can see. It's just deciding this is one way and this is another. Just like Moses told the people, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. If you want to live, there isn't a gray area. This is what you need to do. And those, for those who discerned, that's what they did. So just be thinking about that. But to determine or decide uh, authoritatively after deliberation, to appraise uh, discriminately as an expert or declare after determination. 
a form an opinion about a judge or character to arrive at or draw a conclusion. That, that one's very different than the first definition. Um, informal to have as an opinion or assumption or a supposition to govern or rule. So there's, you see that even in the English language, it's all over the map. And we apply this word that is just a balled up sticky goo mess and throw it at everything. And that's why I'm like, I think we better re-examine this because what we're given is just not clear. And then it also is compounded by the influence and culture that exists around us that says, don't judge me, don't tell me what to do. Da -da 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 -da. And without discernment in our lives, things would go awry very quickly. Um, so a public official who hears and decides cases brought before a court of law and appointed arbitrary of a contest or a competition, one whose critical um, judgment or opinion is sought after or a concierge. So one's like a subject matter expert, the other one's like a judge at a art contest or whatever. And the first one is a, a legal official who presides over a court, a jury, whatever else. And then the last one was um, the leaders of Israel, about 100 year period between Joshua and Saul. Um, there's also justice, which is the principle of moral rightness and equity, um, conformity to moral right and action or aptitude of righteousness to uphold what is just, especially fair treatment and due reward in accordance to honor standards, law and fairness. So when you think about the judges of Israel or about Solomon, and we're, we're looking at something that they were supposed to uphold. When you look at Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and all these other major Old Testament prophets, what was God's charge against the Jews as to why they went into Babylonian captivity? For 200 years, they were warned, if you don't execute blank, then you're going into captivity. Yes, Randy. A justice. Yeah, that was it. They refused to execute just justice. They would not look after the cause of the fatherless, the widow, or the alien. They just were after their own pursuits. And God punished them for their lack of justice. And it was extreme. And they also persecuted the poor. They oppressed the people. Um, and he, God is actually uses the analogy of chopping the poor up and putting them in a pot and the rich people eating them. And actually, there was a, an Irish um, author who used the same imagery and got all the credit, but he, I don't think he attributed it back to the Bible. But this is exactly what's going on here. So um, something that is just or due, the quality of being fair and impartial, um, conformity to truth, fact, or sound reason, the administration of the procedure of law, a judge, a justice of the peace. So these are our English words, and you can see they're, they're all over the spectrum. So when you're saying to judge or judgment, you could mean almost anything. It depends completely on the context of how you're saying it um, in English. So it's to perceive something obscure or concealed, to detect, and this is about discernment, to recognize and comprehend mentally, and to perceive as separate or distinct or dissimilate. Um, sorry, discriminate, to show insight and judgment or perspective. So these are what I'm going to try to propose to you is that we as believers, whether it was Old Testament, New Testament, or now, are never supposed to lay down the gauntlet of discernment for ourselves first, for our families second, and for the ecclesia third. We don't apply it to the world ever. So this is something that has been challenged in all Christianity is basically saying, you know, you're not allowed to discern anymore. Let's put the blindfolds on. Let's just call it a day. You're not allowed to say what's good and what's bad. And the, the danger of all this is what Jeremiah said about his people has already come true of our society. We're evil is called good and good is called evil. So I think that's why this would, is a worthy study of our consideration and to work through together, because I definitely do not have all the answers, how to rightly apply this. So I would propose to you that this is what we're separating when we're talking about 
discernment to bring it to the right level. And we're trying to separate them with the sword of truth. And we're trying to say, these are in their right places. It's categorizing them and making them um, separate, first for ourselves, then for our family, then for our ecclesia. So any thoughts or comments so far? This is a golden opportunity before we get into the Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> yes, Roger. <laughs> uh, oh, excuse me. Um, you had mentioned earlier what was Solomon. I don't know if it, that question ever got answered. What was Solomon's? Yes, that's go ahead. He, yeah. Well, what I come to my mind is, uh, of course, he prayed for wisdom. We know that. That's the main thing but he said that i do not know how to go in or come out that was the discernment i don't to judge so great a people i don't know if you use the word judge or to rule he asked for discernment discernment yeah but because he, he acknowledged he could not discern how to handle this situation and that was probably the wisest prayer he ever gave I, I didn't know if the question got answered or not. It didn't, so thank you for answering oh, okay. it. And the point of all that is, is that when Solomon asked for discernment, he was given wisdom without measure. Because knowledge is one thing, but the application of knowledge is wisdom, and discernment is part of that. Yes, um, Jason. I, I also think it has to do with the redefinition of words. I think, I think sometimes you, you want to gloss over something because you want to call something good that really is evil. And so you redefine words until you get to the point where it's acceptable and comfortable instead of calling it what it really is. Yeah, exactly. And so it's altering people's reality. It's spinning it. It's, you know, um, manipulating reality to try to get to where you can call evil good and good evil. So the other piece of it, what was um, Solomon's first trial. I mean, he is the highest judge in the land. What was his first court trial that he had? The two women. Right. So he has two prostitutes who come before him, both claiming they own the same baby. And nobody would have an easy time judging the situation, no matter how many witnesses you called, how much, how much evidence there was. Um, and so Solomon has the wisdom to put a little pressure on the situation. And it immediately causes a response that reveals the truth. Um, one woman says, neither you nor I will have it. Cut the baby in two. And the other one's like, give her the baby. I don't, I don't want it to, it to die. So we think this is a nice Old Testament story that doesn't have any application today. I would say a lot of times with the divisions in our own households of faith, that is exactly what's going on. Two women both claiming it's their baby and one is perfectly willing to cut it in half because they don't care about the baby. And the other one is looking for peace and was like, we'll give it to you, just don't destroy it. And we see this in Ecclesia after Ecclesia where people are so insistent on their own way, they're willing to cut the baby in half. And we don't have the discernment to see this is Solomon's court trial that was going on all the way back then so there's a grave importance to being able to do this correctly and i'm not saying i understand it all but to me we definitely have to separate ourselves away from the world's theology yes jk correct me if i'm wrong but prostitution was against the law of moses correct uh yeah <laughs> so it, it, here was an opportunity where he could have focused in on this prostitution and completely ignored the actual root of the matter, right? These, uh, their actual grievance, right? He could have just simply focused in on the fact that they are a sinner and therefore uh, they both are deserving of death and therefore use that as an opportunity to kill them. But instead he shows mercy and grace because here they are coming up to the king. Right. Just like um, the uh, witch, when Saul was dealing with her, there, you had these opportunities where they could have easily just killed the person off. And I think it's just a sign of how Jesus works with us, where we are sinners, we all deserve death, but instead he's willing to meet with us and take care of that problem that we're going through and help us get through that point. 
Yeah, he says he doesn't treat our sins as they deserve. So it's really quite remarkable. Um, All right, so, comment, comment. Uh, you, I think you make a good comparison between that and the Ecclesiastes today, but Solomon said, cut the baby in half. So I hope you're going to address that in the modern situation. Um, he, he was saying cut the baby in half to find out what the real truth was. He didn't literally cut the baby in half. Well, I, I know that, but right. in the in your modern jargon, it would be, okay, split the Ecclesiastes. Right. And I hope you're going to address that, how that's not the correct way. It isn't the right way. And, but you, then you find out who the true steward, true parent, true guardian is of the Ecclesia. You know, those who are willing to do whatever it takes to keep it alive instead of splitting it in half because they want to um, influence others to justify their behavior. So that that's just happened. I mean, I was born lived through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and I've seen it over and over and over again. You all have lived longer and probably have seen it even more than I have. So um, that's very true. Yes, Roger? For me, with that, with that subject about cutting the baby in half, I don't think Solomon would have done it. If this is just me looking he at it. To, yeah, yeah he, it, he had no, I don't think he would have followed through with it because he, then he would have murdered the child. And, but uh, the point is, is that he had to test things. Like you're saying, to see who is the real um, uh, caregiver of the, of the child, he had to test those things. And it was, it's very hard for us to swallow if it was your child up there and he's about standing there with a sword, it would really test everyone in the room. And he, of course, God gave him this discernment, but person, I don't think he would have ever cut the baby in half. It's not recorded. No, he, he wouldn't have. It, there's a wonderful expression that says doctors and lawyers do the same thing. They apply pressure to find out the truth, you know, um, and, and that's exactly what he did to get to the real solution. Yes, Jesse. So <clears throat> that reveals who really loves the ecclesia. But what do we do with that information now that we've discerned this? Do you, are you going to address that in upcoming slides? So we've discerned that one group really loves the Ecclesia and one doesn't. Now what do we do with that? You preserve the, the Ecclesia for those who really are the caretakers and the, the ones who love the Ecclesia. Um, but a lot of times what, what I, I've seen in the past, it's sort of like Korah and their rebellion. When they split off, it's a gangrenous limb and it kills itself. Um, but in, in the case of the Ecclesia, you know, we need to put it in the hands of those who are going to preserve it. And we're Walter in the back as a comment. Uh, from Brother Paul Martin. He says, yes, we don't love our neighbors enough to do justice and use our discernment. We want to be right instead of doing right. That's excellent because unfortunately, because of human pride, we never want to admit when we're wrong. We, all, we will fight to be right even if we are wrong and we'll take as collateral damage whoever we can take with us um, by lobbying them and by trying to persuade and influence. And that's the danger in what usually hits an ecclesia that causes a division is how does the ecclesia divide when it happens? There are what I would suggest to you, fractured cleavage planes in the rock, okay? It always splits, I've never seen it any different, it always splits along family lines. And when that happens, what can you surmise? What can you discern? Yes, Michael. I just wanted to say on a positive note, we do have a lot of times where we have disagreements about various things. We vote at business meetings and we do have a lot of situations where people are both like, no, you take the baby, right? Yeah. So there is, you know, we're talking about, you know, fractures, but there's a lot of times where we, we keep everything together, right? No, so, peacemaking yeah. is, is extremely important. I totally agree. Yes, Jesse. Follow up on my question. I think since we can't really take this information and then decide what happens to the ecclesia. We have to apply it to ourselves and say, am I the one that is willing to sacrifice the baby to be right? 
and then act accordingly in our own actions. But we really don't, none of us here will have like the, the control to decide like Solomon did. Right. No, I mean, it's, it's just that he was given great discernment. And I would say all of us can put a lot of weight on praying for wisdom every day and asking God to give us wisdom and discernment in everything we do, what we say, in our actions, in our interactions, because we need to be very wise stewards of what we have and what God has given us. So that's why I think this is a, an extremely important thing to talk about, especially in the last days, because man's influence on our religious beliefs is not going to get lighter, it's going to get more extreme as time goes on. I would hypothesize that in years coming, the government would have control over the ecclesias and their doctrines. They would be able to say, what you believe is discriminatory and we can seize your assets. That's how bad it can get. Things are already censured to that level in Canada with the radio. They basically say, we're going to dictate what you can and cannot say. Because if you show discernment for God, you are discriminatory. Okay? So, just tsunami is coming our way. And this is a grave subject that I think we're going to need wisdom, discernment, and courage to overcome. Because it's not going to be light on us. And it's going to test our metal, and I'm scared. So I always pray, Lord, you take over my body in that instance because I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I just put up this slide to get you a mental picture that there is a wide spectrum of meaning. And we've already looked at it in the English, and it, it's very confusing because there's, there's a judge, there's an arbitrator, there's like a contest kind of judge. Then there's discernment, then there's discernment with punishment, which is actually real judgment. So we want to understand the right application, okay, of this. So we're going to go forward and, and look at these. So as I said before, these are the words in Hebrew and in Greek. There are 14 Hebrew words for judgment and six in the Greek. So we're going to hopefully understand what this means. Um, so this one's very small. It's only used twice in Daniel, and it means judge or diviner or counselor, and it's Adar Garwer. Um, so it's, very, it's used very lightly, and it's only used, like I said, in those two cases in Daniel. The next one is um, Dian, which is, appears uh, 24 times all the way through Scripture. And there's another one. This is 1777. 1778 is a variation on this word, but it means to judge, contend, plead, act as a judge, um, minister judgment, plead the case, execute judgment, require, sorry, requite, vindicate, govern, contend, strive, and to be um, at a strife or quarrel. And if I'm understanding this correctly, these are the various contexts that are used in scripture for this word, dean. Um, and it's used the most time in the book of Judges, which you can see would probably be the, the ones where it is um, talking about the Lord. And then the rest of it is to, I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong. It means judge 18 times. It's used the most in Psalms, in Genesis, and in Jeremiah. Um, so <coughs> something to think about. And I'm, if you want these slides, I'll be glad to give them to you, but I'm just going to fly through them for now. So the second one's pronounced the same way. In 1778, it's used twice, and it means to judge or to tread out. So to tread out is an interesting meaning because it means you're treading out the grain, you're separating the wheat from the chaff, and that is more like discernment, okay, like we were talking about before. Um, and the next one is uh, Dayan, which is only used twice. It's in 1 Samuel and Psalms, and Dayan means a judge, literally. The next one is ta'am, which is um, to taste judgment, uh, decision, or decree. It's used 13 times. And the most amount of time it's used as to taste, which is really interesting because it's like you can test whether something is sweet 
or sour or salty or bitter from your tongue, right? So you're using an instrument to discern and figure out what's going on. So I thought that one was interesting. Um, so the next one is mud, uh, which is um, from Fort, sorry, 4055. It's used 12 times in scripture, and it means to measure a cloth or a garment. So you think about that um, as more about discernment. It's a measurement. Um, and how many times does God say, I set a plumb line in Jerusalem? Why is he saying, I set a plumb line in Jerusalem? It's mostly in Jeremiah. Yes, Jason. Plumb line is as straight as you can get. It goes up and down. And mm -hmm. um, unless there's a lot of wavering going back and forth, it is still a straight line. Mm -hmm. And so he's judging them or discerning for them with that straight line of where we should be. And that's why I think it's interesting because um, this one actually gives us a lot to think about when we talk about it. And the next one is Elohim, which is actually about God, and he is the judge. And that's interesting because it's used so many times in scripture, um, and it's about him being a judge or uh, the diviner of truth. The next one, I'm sorry these are jumping around because uh, I last night was moving them around again. This is Paulil, which is 6414. It's used as a as a judge or judges three times, and it means to give an assessment or to estimate. Um, the next one is Pali Law, which is an official, a judge, or an umpire um, to make a judgment or a decision. Um, this is Pali Law, which is to judge. I know these are not super interesting for you, but I just want to go through and be thorough. Um, this one also is only from Isaiah. It's used once as judgment, or sorry, to judge. And then Palal, which is to intervene, interpose, or pray for. This one's really interesting because it means to be an intermediary or to be someone who intercedes in a judgment situation. So I want to say this for the record right now. If I have to repeat it, I'll be glad to. But we're studying this so we understand it better. And by understanding it better, we will better understand mercy and grace because they're weightier topics and more important than judgment and discernment. But we really can't arrive at that destination, I don't think, unless you understand judgment and discernment. And I'll give you my reason why. <clears throat> Suppose all of this is a train track. When most people transgress against the Lord, they want to go from station transgression right to mercy station right there they want to skip over all the stuff that comes in between they want to escape discernment they want to escape judgment they want to escape punishment and just go right to mercy my question is why would you need mercy or grace if there's no acknowledgement of it if there's no um understanding of discernment in it what makes you feel like you even need mercy because it's illogical. It's going completely out of step with the rest of it. It's a linear thing that is applied to everything in the world. So something to think about. And this is Shafat, which is used over 203 times. And this is probably the most um, used word for it. It is to judge, govern, vindicate, punish, to act as a lawgiver or judge or uh, governor. To, to rule or govern with authority, to decide controversy of, for God, of God and man, to execute judgment, um, discriminating of man, um, vindicating, condemning and punishing, um, a theophantic advocates for, sorry, advent for final judgment, to enter into controversy, plead, have controversy together and to be judged. So it has a wide spectrum of meaning all the way from discernment to more than that. Um, so just keep these in mind. I think they're, they're useful. We're almost at the end. And then Shefat is uh, 8201. It's used 16 times as judgment or the act of judgment. And the, in the Greek, it's diachrono, which is used 19 times. And it has a wide array of meaning. Again, it's from doubt to judge, to discern, to condemn, to waver, or miscellaneous. 
but it means to separate or to make a distinction, to discriminate or prefer, to learn by discrimination, to try, decide, to determine, to give judgment or on a dispute, to withdraw from one's, um, from one, uh, dissent, to separate oneself from a hostile spirit, to oppose, strive, or dispute um, content, to be at variance with oneself, and to hesitate or doubt. So the main thing I see here is discernment, that uh, diachronum actually means, and it's used, like I said, 19 different times. And all, almost all the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Acts, Romans, Corinthians, James, and Jude. So um, that one's a really powerful one. And then the next one is dicastes, which is to judge, to arbitrate, or umpire, and it's used in Luke and Acts. And it's dicastres, um, 1348. We're almost done with this. Uh, chrono is used 114 times. Or credo, I'm sorry, it's 2919, and it's to separate or put asunder, to pick out, um, select, or choose to approve, esteem, or prefer. There's a lot of other definitions. I won't go into all of it, but it's also to serve as an arbitrator and to preside over the power of giving judicial decisions, um, which is the prerogative of kings and judgment. So I think that's the last one. Let's see. Yeah, there's one more. So this is where we get the word criterion or criteria, and it's. Um, Tiron, which is the instrument or means of trying or judging anything, the rule by which one judges, the place of judgment that is given, and the tribunal of the judge, the bents of a judge, and a matter judge things to be decided on. So this one is the most legal in its context of being in a courtroom and being the judge or the place of judgment. Um, and then Kreitz is one who passes or arrogates to himself judgment or anything to be an arbitrator, a Roman uh, pure curator administering uh, justice, God of passing judgment on men or leaders or rulers of the Israelites. So this is used a total of 17 times. It's in the Gospels, it's in Acts, Timothy, Hebrews, and James. Um, so it's just very interesting to know what the, and this is anachrono, which is to examine or judge or to investigate um, to scrutinize. So this is more about the investigation of a situation um, than it's like giving an estimate or that kind of thing and to interrogate. So I'll leave you with this image and then we'll stop here for today. Um, I want us to be able to peel off the layers that don't apply. If the banana is, forgive my bad analogy, <laughs> if the banana is the biblical view of judgment, then we need to remove the modern philosophies that are being pushed on us and applied to us that are creeping into the household of faith. We also need to look at revisionist history because people love to go back and rewrite history and make new claims that aren't true and it's purely for making a name for themselves and not applying truth, which is very dangerous for us. And the last one is the worldly traditions and church traditions that don't have biblical foundation that are being forced on us. So we need to repeal all of these things and get back to the original. Uh, so we'll conclude class with that and thank you for your time.